Welcome back to our negotiation and negotiating across cultures. As I've said in the past lessons, it's very important that you begin to know the way that you negotiate. It's important in management anyway, or in any business, to know who you are and what kind of styles and approaches you use to communication. So we're going to take a look now at the different styles of negotiation and also a closer look at you and the approaches that you take. To start with, there are varying ways of negotiating. We all know that we want to come out with win-win at the end. But in the process of trying to achieve win-win, and depending on who the other party is that you have to negotiate with, you will adopt certain styles. In this chart that you see, we can see that there is the relationship which is important on the left-hand side, and the outcome on the right-hand side which is important. As we went through the program, we have seen that the deal or the relationship which is the most important thing. We have seen the substance or the relationship, which is the most important thing to, to maintain. So here we see that we are relationship oriented or we are outcome, result oriented or deal oriented. If we are relationship oriented, we adopt a style which we call accommodate. And as the word implies, we accommodate. We try to please. We try to make sure things go smoothly so that the relationship is, is, is maintained very, very well. If we are heavily outcome-oriented, we adopt a style which we call defeat, where bargaining is the way you're going to get through this and you're going to compete with the other party no matter what to receive the outcome. In the middle, we find that there is the word collaborate. Collaborate meaning cooperate. And this is the win-win style that we really do hope for. And this win-win style ensures that the relationships are maintained and that the outcomes are also there, where everybody is happy. At the lower end of this chart, you will see compromise and withdraw. When this happens, it means that it's really not win-win for anybody. It's really neither here nor there. The outcome is neither here nor there. There's no real result. Let's take a look now at personality styles chart. In the previous lessons, we talked about the thinker. We talked about the pleaser. We talked about asserter and expressor. And these are different styles we take on, which are maybe predominant in us, or we have a mix of one or two, or perhaps even a third one sometimes, when we are negotiating and communicating. You may have been a thinker, as we discussed before, which can also be described as being analytical. You may have been a pleaser, and which we also can describe as being amiable, friendly, very polite and courteous, easy to get along with. You may have been an asserter, and which we also describe as being pragmatic, fairly practical. Or you may have been an expressor, and here this is described as the extrovert. So you can see on this grid, Emotionalism is strongly dominant in the pleaser, expressor, amiable, extrovert type. Assertiveness is high on the pragmatic, asserter, expressor, extrovert type. These two dimensions, assertiveness and emotionalism, are blended accordingly to where you are on the grid. Where do you think you lie? Which approaches do you naturally take? These things come quite naturally. Our behaviours 
are a natural part of who we are. If you are, for example, a pleaser type, high on the emotional end of the grid, less on the assertiveness, you may find it very difficult to negotiate with someone who's very pragmatic and a very assertive style of person. So whoever is in the corner opposite your corner is the hardest type of person for you to negotiate with. If you find in a negotiation that you have many pragmatic people on the other side of the table, then you will certainly need to have people who can cope with that kind of pragmatic person other than yourself if you are more a pleaser type. So in looking at this grid, you need to think back to when you go to the negotiating table. As we said before in this lesson, or in the previous lesson, that there needs to be a certain blend of personalities at the negotiation, negotiating table. So it's up to you to identify where your dominant style is and how you can blend yourself with others in your party, in your team, so that you are able to match or able to negotiate uh, very well with the other side. If, for example, you have a lot of expressors or extroverts in your team, you will find it very difficult to come up against a team who are a full panel of thinkers. So please guard this carefully. Try to get to know who your opponents are, if you can beforehand, or if you're actually in the process of negotiation. Then try to work out who is who and who has what style, and then try to adapt accordingly. It could be that you might need to bring in someone who can match those styles that you are missing in your team. It's very important to understand that there are strategies and tactics involved in negotiation. And it's all about people. People are the ones who are negotiating, not machinery. People are the ones who have to speak and talk and explain and discuss and ask why, not machinery. And therefore, it's your role to find out exactly who is where and who can match who and who can fight for what you are looking for. Ideally, you want to be matched evenly in the negotiating room. Ideally, but sometimes that doesn't happen in reality. So this knowledge, this information is here to help you build on your own abilities and your own awareness of what happens around that table. It's not just a whole lot of documents sitting in place on the table or a whole lot of legal agreements that have to get through. Those things won't get through unless they're negotiated well by the human beings that are around that table. And therefore, these styles will come into play. And if you wish to have a rewarding win-win situation, then getting to know the styles of other people and being able to counter them and match them is the responsibility that you have. Let's look further at the five basic negotiation styles. If we see on this screen, we look at five boxes. And in those five boxes, there will be familiar terms there for you to see. We can see that we have two lines. We have a horizontal line which is entitled Concern for Substance. Okay, this means concern for results, concern for outcome, concern for the final product you get in your hand and take away. 
It ranges from low to the left to high on the right. Then we see the vertical axis, which is headed concern for relationship. Concern for the bonding between the two parties. Concern for the business relationships between the two companies and those people in the room. We see there is the low and the high level on that axis. In the boxes on this slide are descriptions of how we can approach or how we do approach certain negotiations. And we have been through some of these previously. But here is a lot more detail. And when you go through this, try to think of the instances where you are dealing with people from other cultures as well. See where they might, might fit in in these boxes. If we take a look at the first box, accommodate. Accommodate, as we have seen before, this, this type of negotiation style has great concern for maintaining or building very good relationships between the two parties. Perhaps they place more importance on the relationship above the actual fairness of the outcome or the result. That may be a good thing for the company, or it may not be a good thing. But here, this is a style where a company may say, look, our relationship is much more important than, than uh, the problems we're encountering now with the product. Let's come back later to talk about the product. Here, this style really wants to promote harmony and really wants to save the relationship above all costs rather than think about the money, so to speak. So in the accommodate style, here we could say that this is the pleaser. This is the pleaser who wants to be amiable and who is high on the, the list, high on the relationship concern at the expense of the outcome. If we look below the accommodate box, here we will see the word avoid, and we can also use the word withdraw as well. In this particular style, it could be that you feel so powerless and you cannot really get anywhere that you're just prepared to take what you can get and get out of there. So you tend to avoid problem solving. You tend to avoid continuing any further because you know actually that you're not going to go anywhere with any further discussion. You take what the other party is willing to concede and you withdraw. Now, perhaps you come away uh, happy that you got something, but actually this is not a very successful way of negotiating. It means you've given up, in other words. You've given in to the power of the other person, of the other party, and you've just taken what you can get. You may find when you go back to your company or organization, they may be very unhappy with what you've come away with. Here, this style of being overpowered or overwhelmed by the other party and not being able to problem solve means that you are also low on the relationship side of the negotiation and also low on getting the outcome. You're low on concern for the relationship between the two parties and low on concern for the outcome. If we look to the centre, we see the word compromise. Compromise, here is where you split the difference. And you meet halfway. Perhaps you're not really happy, but you trade off things so as at least you can get something. You get something halfway. You're not getting the actual full result that you went in looking for. You would prefer, rather than have conflict and discuss and argue and have heated discussions and have a, a specialist brought in, you would prefer to reduce that conflict uh, rather than sit down and solve the problem along with the other party. Here, this means that you are 
halfway on concern for relationships and halfway on concern for the outcome. You are really neither here nor there. You are one thing nor the other. So here you're splitting the difference and you're coming away with something. You're meeting halfway. It's not the full outcome that you had originally intended. If we look to the box on the right-hand side, you'll see the word defeat. And we can also say compete here as well. This is the bargaining. This is the very competitive, argumentative style where you want to win and you don't care if the other side loses at all. You're high on the end in concern for substance. You want to come away with what you want, regardless of what the other party feels, regardless of what the other party wants. This is a win-lose situation where you win and they lose. So here you are wanting to win at any cost. You are competing, you are fighting, and this sometimes can be a very argumentative, very uh, pressured type of negotiation style where people are intimidated or people are threatened in some ways. It can become quite a nasty way of negotiating. But it depends what you really want to do at the end of the day. Some people will try to defeat you, or maybe you may be the defeater in some instances, depending on the other party and depending what you are negotiating. The main goal in this particular style is to defeat the other party. That is the main goal and take away the substance, take away the outcome. If you don't see the other party again, that's not your concern, or that's not you, not what you really feel about. Quite a ruthless kind of style, but in some uh, businesses, very, very effective, uh, very, very necessary. If uh, the opponent is a very, very tough, tough opponent, and one who uses uh, dirty tactics perhaps, or who is not as honourable as you would like them to be. So then you'd have to go in there fighting and come away winning. Depending on the situation, this is a style that is also used. And then we come to the top box in the right-hand corner. And if you look here, you will see that this is high at the high end of concern for substance and it's also high on the line concern for relationships. So both of these things are very important to the collaborator and this therefore means that this style is the one where problem solving is used, where cooperation amongst the two parties or three or four parties is how the negotiation will proceed and both parties will be looking for a win-win situation. That is where they both feel satisfied with the outcome. In this style, both parties will search for common interests and they will sit together regardless of how long it takes to be able to come up with the right things that are necessary to win for both sides. They will have mutual respect, they will have concern for each other, and they will synergize in order to reach solutions. They're not going to sit there and argue just for the sake of arguing. If there is argument, if it does start, then in this kind of style, it is positive argument meaning that it will bring up issues that can be acted on and solved together. A lot of negotiations have argument. A lot of negotiations see hot tempers flare and see people getting angry and uh, upset and annoyed and people wanting to walk out. But depending on who you have at that negotiation table, then depending on them and how they take care of the proceedings, you can come out still in a win-win situation. Bringing people round, 
understanding the other person, understanding the culture they're from, and trying to sit down and find common shared objectives and work towards them will bring that win-win negotiation to the forefront. So the main purpose here is to use relationship building, to use the ability to understand the other side, to use the ability to know the other culture and the limitations of that culture and misunderstandings that may happen with the other side. Can you see where you normally sit? In which box are you sitting? Which style do you find yourself in? Which style do you think you should perhaps try to implement or improve upon so you can reach a win-win situation? It may not be possible every time to reach win-win. Maybe the third and fourth time you meet, you will reach win-win. But certainly the aim is to work towards it. And if you can basically see the different styles and basically understand your individual style, then you know where you are headed and where your opponents are headed as well because they also are individuals and they will adopt the styles here that you see as well. So this is not just you. This is everyone. This is how we behave. Accommodate, place relationship above everything else. Avoid and withdraw. Take whatever you can because you're powerless and you need to get out of there with something or whatever comes your way. Compromise. Well, here you meet halfway, you trade off what you can and uh, you don't really want to sit there and problem solve. The relationship and the substance, they're sort of equally important, but you're not going to have conflict along the way. You want to reduce conflict and just take a compromise. If you use defeat, then as you know, you are a winner at all costs. That is the most important aim of your meeting. And if you are a collaborator or a cooperator, then here, this is the win-win benefit. This is the win-win box where you see that the main purpose is win-win for everybody to feel good about the final result. We need competitive negotiation. Sometimes that happens, you know. We don't always have the very textbook smooth negotiation that we read about. As you know in your experience, you are negotiating really in two different ways. You are either competing and really bargaining and really pushing and trying to defeat. And it may be that that's what's required sometimes. Um, here, both parties want to maximize their gains. They both want to get as much as possible. Um, but one party will lose, definitely. So this type of negotiation is the defeat negotiation style. And then we have the collaborative negotiation style, where win-win is important and finding balanced, realistic agreements are important. Remember, we talked about having stability in the agreements. And when you have stability in the agreements, then you can build relationships. And when you build relationships, you can also build trust. And you can build further relationships with that client. So it's quite fair to say that realistically, we should be aiming for collaborative negotiation. And as an executive and a senior manager, it's your responsibility to push yourself further, to get to hone those skills that you have in problem solving and interpersonal relations so that your team can work towards discussing and cooperating and collaborating with the other team. You need to spend the time to do that too. 
nothing is going to happen very quickly. So it takes perseverance and determination and all those skills that you have, all those competencies you have as an executive to be able to ensure that the collaboration process, the win-win outcome, is there. I've seen many examples where people have negotiated for days and days and days and the negotiations have gone on early into the mornings People have become tired. New teams have come in to support old teams. People have actually come to stay in the hotels where the negotiations are taking place because there's been a major, major deal being discussed. And it's admirable to see that these negotiations are led by people who sincerely wish to reach the win-win outcome. At all costs, their aim is win-win. And their responsibility to their organization is to win-win so that the future and long-term benefit can come. Sometimes the expense of long and hard negotiations is well worth the effort. Well worth it. Because it builds business. It means that you can go back to that partner in the future and have an excellent relationship and further develop business together. It means profitability. Profitability that will boost your, your earnings for your organization and profitability that will make the economy as a whole build itself up. So the importance of win-win and Collaborative negotiation cannot be expressed enough. It is your role. It is your duty to try to get that outcome, if you possibly can. I have an activity here for you, and perhaps you may like to think about a recent negotiation that didn't turn out the way you wanted it to. And think about what went wrong. Maybe this is an activity that you can spend a bit of time on whenever you have 10, 15 minutes, or even longer than that, and try to analyze the situation. Now that we have gone through some of the very important aspects of negotiation and negotiating with other cultures, Think about something, as I said, that went wrong with a recent negotiation and you may find your answers more quickly than you thought. What went wrong? Was it the fact that you didn't understand them? Was it the fact that you didn't want to understand them? Was it the fact that you thought you were better than them? There are so many things that can come up here. Was it the fact that you were not prepared and suddenly unexpected things, unexpected responses threw you off and therefore you weren't able to, to gain greater ground? You lost. What went wrong? The idea behind your role as a manager and an executive is always to do a post-mortem, we say after every negotiation, even if the negotiation went very, very well. After that, regroup with your team or sit with your colleague or executive who, who helped you in the negotiation and go through and analyze it. Ask yourself the questions, if it went well, ask yourself the questions, what can we do better? Next time, what are the things that we can do to make it even better? If, of course, it didn't go well, then here we are. Ask yourself, what went wrong? And if you can't answer that yourself, then gather your team together and sit and meet and talk about it. This is absolutely necessary so you can improve upon your skills for the next time. Negotiation, as I said, in any country, can become a very nasty situation, an unfair situation where sometimes the other party might use uh, techniques that 
catch you unaware, that cause you to lose, cause you to uh, think again. So I'd just like to highlight some of these things and perhaps you can begin to look at them more closely as you examine what went wrong in the last part of this lesson. Sometimes negotiators like to, to confuse you and these unfair tactics sometimes mislead you so that you begin to think different things. A negotiator can bring in information that is not quite correct. It's not openly dishonest, but it's not quite correct. And therefore, the introduction of this kind of information may lead you to think other things. And when that happens, the balance and the discussion is thrown out. So the the arguments occur or the disagreements become excessive. Sometimes negotiators, if they're, they want to defeat you, if they really want to uh, compete and beat you into the ground, they will use personal attacks. They will talk about perhaps the way you conduct business and attack you personally, which is very unfair and very non-professional. They may try to manipulate agendas or the timing of the meetings and say they have to leave early, that they didn't realize that uh, it was going to take so long, but they, they're not going to wait because it's a waste of time. Perhaps they may use these sorts of tactics to throw you out. So they want to gain the upper hand in the discussion, in the negotiation process. Other techniques they might use are what we call good cop and bad cop, where these two guys fight each other and they are set upon each other to more or less battle it out. And this type of thing can be very disconcerting to the rest of the group and the rest of the process. It could be that the technique they use is that they're going to escalate the problem and go to a higher authority and say that they're not part of this and that they have to take this to the next level. This also can disrupt and be unfair in the negotiation process. Or they may use emotional blackmail. Blackmailing you, blackmailing your feelings. If we don't get this done, then our whole relationship is over. They may use tactics like this that really throw you out and that really can upset the balance. Normally, these sorts of unfair techniques would be used by someone who is in a defeat style, a very competitive style, who is out there just to win at all costs. So be ready for them, because you will come up against those people in that style. If they want to take away everything, if they don't want to give much into you, they're going to go all out and use tactics that are really going to make you want to give up. That is not the aim of what you want to do. You need to try to problem solve regardless of how unfair you think these tactics are. How do you respond to these sorts of things? Well, try to manage your emotions about them. Try not to match their hot-headedness or their anger with your hot-headedness or anger. That is not professional. The way to respond is not jump in and react and act in a negative way. Manage your emotions here. And emotional intelligence is a very, very important part of this process. Knowing that if you manage how you react and respond in an emotionally intelligent way, then you may be able to override those unfair tactics. It won't be easy, it'll be very tough, but if you can manage your emotions well, you may be able to bring back and save this process. Just because you're being pushed and you have a defeating style as your opponent doesn't mean that you can't still get up and win and win-win. 
It means that you have to try harder. You have to really, really work harder to try to come to some collaboration through problem solving. Refocus on the issue. Get back to the issue when these tactics are thrown at you. Use your collaborative style. Bring back the focus. Don't let them upset you or take you off track. Identify too and let them know that these tactics are unfair and that your side would prefer them not to be used and that you come back to the negotiation in a very positive way and a balanced way. Let them know that. Sometimes it may also pay if you change the physical environment. It could be that that might make the whole thing have a different perspective. It could be that the environment actually is not very worthy of the discussion anyway that may have caused these tactics to be used. But sometimes a change of place is as good as starting afresh, starting anew, and coming back and focusing on the issue right from the beginning. Finally, in this segment, we have some other hints that might help you in negotiation. And these can be used across the board. It doesn't matter whether you are talking to a South African or whether you are talking to someone from Venezuela or whether you are talking to someone in Vietnam or your other colleagues far away across the globe. These general hints can really, really help you. First up, be true to yourself. Really follow what you truthfully want. Don't sway to what other people want. Keep true to what you are there for and who you are and the way you wish to handle the negotiations. This will save you. It will show your honesty, sincerity and you will gain respect from the other side. So be true to who you are. Be knowledgeable, an absolutely essential thing. Get the knowledge. Know what you're talking about. Have all that knowledge with you. As I said in the beginning of this program, in the beginning of this lesson, having the knowledge is very, very essential to successful negotiations. And if you feel you don't have knowledge, or you don't have the knowledge that you need for the negotiation, then find it. Get people to help you. Get it. Find it from somewhere and really, really study it. Be optimistic. Optimism is one of the emotional intelligent competencies, and being optimistic is certainly going to help you through a negotiation at any time of day in any country. People will see it. They will read it on your face and they will feel it in your attitude. And a tone of optimism can change the tone of a whole room. So be optimistic. Always look for the future, for the end result. Know that it's going to be a win-win and, and be bright and optimistic about it. Sometimes, if you have to, say no. You don't always have to agree on matters in the negotiation, on all matters. You will find times where you don't agree. And so, therefore, when that time comes, say no. Say no if it's necessary. And no can be said in a very positive way, in a way that is not going to harm or upset anybody. It's a very real thing. It has to be said. So have the courage to say no and explain why. Don't just say no and then nothing. Of course, follow it up. Follow it up with explanation. Follow it up with what you require. Follow it up with your reasons. So say no if it is absolutely necessary. Be flexible and adaptable. If you are too rigid in the way that you conduct your business, then you may find you will lose more. If you are too flexible, 
then of course that is also not a good thing. So find the balance, find common ground, find the way that both of you can work together and maybe you are flexible to a point. Flexibility in a controlled sense and using your EI here, flexibility can also be a very, very helpful technique in negotiations. And as well as being flexible, be calm and confident at the same time. Calmness will get you everywhere. Confidence also will help you go to the next step, which might be difficult, but if you're confident, you can take that next step. Of course, try not to do all the talking. There is a certain amount of talking to do in negotiations. However, there is a lot of listening as well. One of the most important parts of communication is listening and active listening. When you're dealing with particularly people of other cultures, here your listening skills will have to be very, very sharp. So listen, listen, listen in the negotiation process. And finally, don't rush things. I realize you've got important meetings, you've got important things to do apart from the negotiation at hand. However, negotiation is an investment for your company for its long-term benefit and development. So negotiation of all business ventures should be seen as a very quality process, high quality process, and therefore take the time that is required. Don't rush it. If you need more time, then you adjust your schedules accordingly. So use the time well and take the time required and don't rush. I do hope that these lessons are bringing to you some important information about how you should conduct your negotiations. It is true that many of you have experience but also, just having experience doesn't mean that you are the expert. Experts always need to build on their learning, to continuously learn to improve their skills. And in these lessons I'm taking you through, there are certain aspects that will apply to some of you and some others will pick up on aspects that apply more personally to them. So build on your own capabilities through these lessons that we go through. And always ask yourself questions. It's important as you grow as an executive and a senior manager who has the responsibility to do business on an international scale, it is important that you regularly look at how you can further develop yourself. Thank you very much for your time and I look forward to seeing you in our next lesson.